These are the oldest stories online at oldeststories.net. Today, we tell the story of a man with no name who comes from a city that did not exist before he appeared and was lost to history after the collapse of his dynasty. He spoke a strange alien language unfamiliar to the Sumerians and invented new and terrifying weapons of war with which he subjugated the entire world. To history, he is known only as Sharu Kin, meaning the true king. But the first epic-defining historical figure in human history is more usually known as Sargon, the Great of Akkad. The city of Akkad would have been called Agad in its own time. The more common name is actually the one we get from the Hebrew Bible, but it is remarkable for being almost completely obscure, despite being the capital city of basically the whole known world for 200 very influential years. And seriously, I cannot understate what a sea change the Akkadian Empire is from everything that has come before in the tens of thousands of years since mankind first left Africa. We can't attribute everything to Sargon, of course, since we can already see the first groping towards empire and the many drives towards hegemony launched by Uruk and Lagash and other cities over the 500 years of the early dynastic period. But Sargon was the right man in the right place at the right time. And as we go through his story, we will be marking out what makes his Akkadian Empire uniquely an empire above what I've been calling mere hegemons up to this point, specifically to differentiate them from the coming Akkadian Empire. Much of his biography is fragmentary, and so a fair bit of this story is interpolation and interpretation, but we should be used to that by now with these stories. Already with his birth, we get a legend that is basically a trope of the ancient Near East, and thus likely not true. But we didn't let that stop us with Gilgamesh, or indeed any of the other figures that we've seen with this show. With that in mind, Sargon was born to a priestess of Ishtar, who put him in a basket and floated him down the river, just like Moses and Cyrus and a fair number of other literary figures of the era. He was recovered by a couple who lived around the city of Kish. Now, whether the town he was born in was Akkad, or if the town he was raised in was Akkad is unclear, or even if Akkad existed at all until he constructed it, but in any case, he was born into a Semitic community living near Kish, raised by a gardener named raised by a gardener named Laibam and his wife Enitam. Kish was the extreme north of the cultural region of Sumer, and though definitely part of the broadly defined Sumerian culture, seems to have had a fair bit of mixing from the Semitic peoples who lived north and west of there. So Sargon would have been erased bilingual. As he grew older, he was able to secure a position in the palace of the king of Kish, originally as a laborer, it seems, but then eventually as a cupbearer for the king himself. A servant to be sure, but also a position for a very trusted fellow, and one who would have had the ear of the king. King Urzababa had done a great deal to rebuild the fortunes of Kish after its defeat by Lagash a generation prior, and with the collapse of the Lagashite hegemony, he had begun to establish Kish as a northern power at the same time that we have Lugal Zagazi building up his proto-empire in the south. But for some unexplained reason, the two highest gods, Enlil, king of gods and decreer of destiny, as well as his father An, lord of heaven, chose to remove Urzababa's kingly mandate and begins to sap the prosperity of Kish. Since he has lost divine favor, he begins to have terrible dreams, dreams so bad that he pees himself in the night, and he grows so ill that his urine turns to blood and pus. Sargon too, now the favored of the gods and particularly favored by Ishtar, is given the same dreams. Somehow, Urzababa hears that his cupbearer is getting horrible dreams at the same time he himself is being given them, and calls Sargon into his chambers. 
He asks what sort of dreams Sargon is getting, and Sargon, with perhaps a bit of reckless honesty, says that he saw a young woman with divine radiance, and he saw that woman drowning Urzababa in a river of blood. Well, this was apparently the same dream Urzababa was getting, which confirmed to him where the divine favor had migrated to, and the king did not appreciate it in the least. And so he handed Sargon his bronze hand mirror, a symbol of great luxury in the era, and he said, I need to regain the favor of Ishtar. Take this to the metal worker in the heart of Ishtar's temple here in Kish, and have him melt it down into an offering for the goddess. Sargon went off to do as instructed, but Urzababa had secretly dispatched a messenger ahead of him, instructing the metal worker to throw Sargon into the smelting fire as well. The fact that Urzababa felt the need to off his cupbearer in such a roundabout fashion suggests something that will play a part in events to come. Sargon must have been a fairly popular figure in the city, and likely acted as a representative for the Semitic peoples of Kish, possibly even acting as a patron for a good number of Sumerians as well, thus preventing Urzababa from simply executing the troublemaker for fear of sparking an uprising. But fortunately for Sargon, the goddess Ishtar hears all that occurs in her temple, and so stopped her new champion at the gates of her temple, refusing him access and having a lower servant bring the bronze mirror for smelting. No word as to whether the lower servant was thrown in the fire or not. Following this, Sargon, quite wisely, refused to return to the palace, laying low among his supporters for a while, a week maybe. But finally, the king gave him a direct summons and he was unable to refuse. Sargon entered the king's bedchamber, his powerful eyes glowering. Sargon knew that the man in bed desired his death. Urzababa cowered beneath his gaze, fully aware that Sargon also knew what was going on. And for a moment there, there was a silent scene, contrasting the formal power of the two men with the personal force in each of them. Finally, the weak king cleared his throat and announced his business. Lugalzagezi, having conquered the whole of the south, was turning his attentions northwards to Kish. Sargon knew this, of course, uh, the whole city would have been buzzing about it, and so it was no surprise when the king asked him to play messenger and bring a clay tablet to Lugalzagezi to open negotiations. Interesting to note at this point, the legend of Sargon was of course written after the founding of the empire, sometime during the Akkadian period, or perhaps even slightly later than it, and the scribe feels that it's necessary to mention that in the old days, the events of the story, they did have writing, they weren't that backwards, but they didn't yet have a postal system, so it was necessary to designate messengers like this. Also, lacking a postal system, they did not yet put letters inside of sealed envelopes with the addresses of the recipient written on the outside, which meant that the contents were not secure from the messenger. This matters because instead of sending a request for negotiations to the powerful southern hegemon, Urzababa sent a note asking Lugal Zagezi to kill the bearer of this message upon receiving it. This is, of course, another common literary trope of the Bronze Age. Now we are sadly missing the punchline here. Did Sargon, literate despite his low birth, read the unsecured message? Did he deliver it to Lugal Zagezi, who decided to talk with Sargon before killing him? However it happened, Lugal Zagezi did not oblige his fellow king, and instead entered in an alliance with the now obviously disgruntled former cupbearer. The two hatched a plan. The southerners would besiege the city and attack from without, while Sargon mobilized his political supporters and led an attack from within the city. Also, Sargon may have seduced Lugal Zagezi's wife during this period of negotiation, a fact which would have no bearing on future events and is likely no more than Bronze Age smack talk. Sargon snuck back into town and soon enough the armies of Lugal Zagezi appeared on the horizon. When the southerners saw the walls of Kish, they were dismayed. Kish was famously the great northern bastion, and it was often said that whoever could take the south and also could take Kish could style himself king of the whole world. 
There was a reason Lugal Zagazi had put off capturing it for so long, after all. And so they made light skirmishes to test the walls, but delayed the main push. Sargon had a narrow window to act here, and appears to have pulled off his coup brilliantly. Leveraging discontent with the recent economic downturn and dismay as being besieged, as well as likely claiming divine favor, Sargon's faction was able to overrun the palace and institute a full regime change almost overnight. When Lugal Zagazi learned that the coup had happened without his military support, he was quite glad of the easy victory and sent a messenger to Sargon, asking that he yield the city and offer up submission for a peaceful entry into the glorious hegemony of Uruk. He would likely have been offered governorship over the city that he had just taken, in exchange for a small display of submission and gifts. But the messenger returned empty-handed saying that Sargon was refusing to yield the city as had been promised, and the defenders on the wall were, if anything, more resolute than ever. At this point, things are again unclear, but either Lugal Zagazi hadn't brought enough soldiers for a full siege of Kish, trusting in the two-pronged assault plan, or Sargon, who is undoubtedly a military genius, was able to lead the defense of his city quite convincingly. Either way, the Southerners were overwhelmed and eventually backed off, returning home for the season. Sargon was now in command of Kish and the surrounding region, and here his story begins in earnest. The first thing he does is move his capital to the previously obscure city of Akkad. This was likely a pragmatic decision, but one emblematic of many of the changes his new empire was going to witness. On the pragmatic side, Kish was an old, large, and powerful city, and Sargon himself had just manipulated the many power blocks within the city to seize power for himself. The obscure city of Akkad, by contrast, was Semitic and lightly populated, and so by filling it with his supporters and fellow Semites, he could assure for himself a stable power base within his palace. The next thing to note is that Akkad is a Semitic city, and Sargon is establishing a Semitic empire. The Semitic language had taken the Sumerian writing system, as well as a great deal of its culture, words, practices, outlook, and religion. In fact, when a Semitic Akkadian learned how to write, they would be learning in the Sumerian edubas, the scribal training schools, and thus would all have been at least bilingual. As the empire grows, the new Akkadian Semitic language is going to merge quite heavily with the older Sumerian language, but the resultant mixed language will ultimately be displacing Sumerian, first in administration and then in daily life. This is a big deal, but we also shouldn't overstate this. For the Sumerians, and by extension the Semitic Akkadians who share their worldview, the race and language of a person is not super important. There are basically no ethnic tensions between Sumerians and at least these sorts of Semites in Mesopotamia, and they share nearly identical lifestyles from a material point of view. The important distinction that they made in those days was between civilized people who lived in cities and the foul-smelling animalistic barbarians. To a man from Uruk, a Sumerian from Lagash was no more or less foreign than a Semite from Kish or even an Elamite from Susa. But a nomadic Gutian or Amorite was human trash, often despised in the harshest terms. And so the Semitic nature of the Akkadian Empire is important historically and will introduce a number of changes on the civilizational level, but it's not one despised by the Sumerian populace on racial grounds, like we might think of today. Akkadians would always be foreigners in any city they conquered, but they wouldn't be disparaged in racial terms or civilizational terms. Another thing to note is that Akkad was a purely secular city. All the great cities of Sumer that we have been discussing up until this point were, to a certain extent, temple cities. 
The Sumerians themselves were only occasionally aware of this, it seems, but archaeologically speaking, we can say that basically all the major cities seem to have been founded alongside temples, and it may have been the construction of fixed, permanent temples that induced the population to originally settle down in a single place. That may, of course, be reversing cause and effect, but either way, temples are foundational to the Sumerian city. I've been glossing over it because it's a fairly complicated and obscure issue, but the early rulers of all these cities were priest kings called Ensi. But from time to time, dynasties would arise of military kings called Lugal. Note the names Lugal Zagazi, Lugal Banda. These are all names with the word king in them, possibly regnal names. The interplay of secular and religious leadership was a major factor in the internal politics of each city, but unfortunately it's almost impossible to explicate clearly because of the lack of sources. We saw it in the crudest form in our discussion of Lagash, but it was often far more subtle than that. In any case, Akkad having no major indigenous temples meant that the Akkadian Empire was going to be the first fully secular kingship in Mesopotamian history, and the days of the priest kings as they were understood in the early dynastic period is pretty much over. Now, don't conclude from this that Sargon was an atheist or some sort of religious reformer. He was personally just as conventionally pious as anyone else. He just wanted power for himself instead of the temples. Of course, like many things, this is less a revolutionary change than a completing of a gradual shift that had been in the works for quite some time. Lugal Zagazi, as his very name suggests, was a Lugal, not an Ensi. Similarly, many of the military innovations that Sargon is going to be making over the course of the next few years are ones that we have hints of previously in the record. But documentation is spotty, and in any case, any particular early dynastic city would have had slightly different methods of warfare, changing from city to city, and even king to king within a city. It is frankly impossible to say how much Sargon is innovating militarily, except to say that he clearly is innovating to a certain extent. But also, he is reputed to be such a singular genius that he likely could have defeated all the same enemies that he ended up beating, even without his slight technological edge. Which, in a very roundabout fashion, brings us back to our story. Sargon spends some time organizing his army, while Lugal Zagazi in the south spends some time gathering his forces as well. When the two forces met on the Mesopotamian plains, it is a battle of old and new. Again, we can't say much for sure about Lugal Zagazi's army, except that it would likely have been the best the early dynastic period had to offer. Well-armored phalanx formation pikemen flanked by skirmishers, armed with a hodgepodge of slings, javelins, and bows, and led by a cadre of chariots driven by the nobility of the many cities under Uruk's hegemony. Facing them would have been a superficially very similar army, but one that may have looked cleaner and more practiced even at this early stage. The spearmen were almost certainly equipped uniformly. State provision of weapons had been a sometimes thing for the earlier cities, but was an always thing for the Akkadians. And the blocks of each phalanx were standardized to be ten men wide and six men deep, a sixty-man maniple with the spears of such a length that the spear tips of the very last row were just able to peek out past the front row's shield, so the full 60 spear tips would be exposed to anyone coming at the formation head on. Each man wore a tall conical bronze helmet that added to their height, making the men seem more imposing to the enemy, and also creating a densely packed forest of bronze cones above the formation, deflecting a certain amount of missile fire. The front rank carried much larger rectangular shields, and everyone wore an axe at their belt. The entire formation was trained to hold a tight phalanx during normal operations, but also to loosen formation in certain tactical situations, such as in rough terrain or when facing enemies harder to pin, 
like the more mobile barbarian tribes. And in loose formation, the spears would have been stowed, and the enemy that fell into their block would be surrounded and hacked apart by the Akkadian axes. Sargon did away with the loose mob of skirmishers almost entirely, replacing them with blocks of archers. These archers would have been armed with composite bows, an innovation that the Semitic peoples had been adopting from more northern neighbors. Archery was hardly unknown to the Sumerians, and for a people who, as of yet, had never heard of horses, the composite bow in itself offered very few advantages, being in that climate very comparable to a more traditional self-bow. But they may have had advantages in terms of manufacture in that comparatively woodless region, and in any case, the real advantage was the fact that Sargon deployed his archers in solid blocks, unleashing torrents of arrow fire, while the southerners were dropping a drizzle of assorted missiles. Archery was not the single decisive weapon of Akkadian warfare that remained the line of infantry, but it did a much better job of weakening the enemy main line prior to engagement than the old skirmisher tactics did. With regard to chariots, the other mainstay of Near East combat, there's a fair bit of disagreement in the sources. The Sumerians did not have horses, so their chariots were pulled by a now almost extinct species similar to donkeys called onagers, an animal grossly inferior to horses for most human purposes. These onagers were also used for agricultural purposes like pulling plows. The chariots themselves were four-wheeled, and they hadn't even invented spokes yet, so they rolled along solid blocks of wood. In fact, they are so primitive that some researchers even refuse to call them chariots, preferring instead to call them battle wagons. Well, in previous times, they were used as a mixed platform for running down enemies, engaging in noble chariot duels, and launching javelins into the enemy lines. For Sargon, however, the heroic myth of the noble charioteer held no romance, and they were unquestionably de-emphasized within his military. And it makes sense, seeing as how a single chariot was a massive expense in those days, one that could have purchased many spearmen and archers. Some look at the fact that the main advantage of the composite bow in warfare is the fact that it's smaller and can more easily be used by horseback and extrapolate from that that the Akkadians must have been converting their battle wagons into mobile arrow platforms and keeping them away from the main battle, while others think that they were relegated solely to a transport and logistical role. All we can say for sure is that for Sargon and his dynasty, the military priority was blocks of well-trained spearmen backed up by an unusually massive archer corps. The main features of this army were likely all present here at the pivotal battle against Lugal Zagazi and his southerners, and in a single massive pitched battle, the Akkadians shattered the Sumerians completely. The details are fairly unclear about the circumstances of the actual battle, but at the end of it, the combined forces led by Uruk are decisively crushed and Lugal Zagazi himself is in chains and carted around with a rope tied to his neck. Now, when Lugal Zagazi made himself hegemon, he did it in the traditional way. Each fighting season, he would muster an army, select a target, and subdue them. Then next year, he would pick a new target. The lesser cities could usually per be persuaded diplomatically when the great cities around them were taken, but it was for the most part a gradual process. Sargon, however, did something unprecedented in Mesopotamian history. Having won the battle, sacked and conquered Uruk, and taking the enemy king as a humiliated captive, he did not disband his soldiers to go home and enjoy the spoils of war and get ready for the next season of harvest. Instead, he continued on a whirlwind tour of Sumer, in short order conquering Ur, Lagash, and Umma. Then he marched his army to the Persian Gulf and washed his weapons in the sea, marking himself as conqueror of everything this side of the world, a ritual that would become standard for later kings. Following this, he brought his army into the spiritual capital of Sumer, the city of Nippur, and marched at the head of his army in a triumphal procession. In no time flat, 
he became the king of Sumer and Akkad, a title that would echo throughout the ages, all the way to King Seleucus I in 300 BCE, 2,000 years later. But we're getting ahead of ourselves again. Sargon is simply too quick for us. How did he manage to conquer all of Sumer basically overnight? It all comes down to the scale of the great battle between Sargon and Lugal Zagazi. The Sumerian king held nothing back against the Akkadians, and noble families from every city in Sumer were present. When the Sumerians were destroyed, many, many prisoners were taken, and many of them were likely used as leverage in persuading the cities to surrender peaceably. Additionally, recall during the Lagash episodes that the kings of Lagash, at their height, were taking work details from other cities. Well, by Lugal Zagazi's time, that was becoming increasingly common, and his army at this battle was said to contain men from all 50 cities of Sumer. With the prime fighting men of Sumer destroyed, Sargon knew that a blitz campaign was necessary to take the cities before they were able to rebuild their strength. And so, with his triumphal procession in Nippur, for which there would have been witnesses from every major city in the region, and likely captives from most as well, Sargon founded his empire. The first change is that the age of citizen soldiers was over. The Akkadian Empire bore witness to the first professional soldiers in history. They trained when they weren't fighting, giving them an edge in discipline, endurance, and tactical flexibility, and their weaponry was standardized by the state. They were personally loyal to Sargon himself. Supposedly all 5,400 of his core troops ate at his table, and could march anywhere on earth at any time of the year. In all likelihood, there was a highly disciplined corps of Akkadian troops that formed the nucleus of his army, then additional men were raised or dismissed as campaigns were announced and completed. But even these surplus soldiers would have been trained to a certain extent and were recruited into a body dominated by professionals. So here we are. Sargon of Akkad rules over all of Sumer and has shown himself to be a military genius unequaled by any who came before. But in all honesty, nothing yet really sets Sargon apart from the various other uniting kings that came before him. We've seen men rise to kingship from humble station. We've seen kings conquer all of Sumer. We know though it's hard to see clearly in the record, that there was a gradual shift towards more regularized fighting forces during the centuries. We know that NC priest kings were gradually being replaced by secular warrior kings, so his secularization of government is again simply following pre-existing trends. On the other hand, we did see a few impressive feats here as well. Simply the fact that the son of a gardener could become literate and become a king's cupbearer and also a major local political figure is a solid resume. Add to that the Sumerian Blitzkrieg and the Sargon figure is starting to look pretty interesting. And so join me next week as we continue the story and watch promising beginnings flourish into the world's first empire. Thank you for listening.